Hello, sportsmen. Hey, how do you like this weather we've been having? I'll tell you one thing, it makes it very difficult to tape features for an outdoor show. Every day it changes. Last week it rained, the rivers are still swollen, they're muddy. Uh, ice is trying to reform on the lakes. You can't trust the ice though because you can't trust the weather. All we can do is dig into our library and show you how things should be at this time of year. So you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost trying to deal with some rather impractical weather patterns in our great outdoors. Higgins Lake is a big, deep lake. It freezes over later than most, but once the ice is thick enough, it's a great place to fish for lake trout and splake through the ice a hundred or more feet down. Now, Bernie Hines used to live in Houghton Lake year-round. Recently, his winters have been spent in the Florida Keys, where he fishes in the sun day in and day out. I think he misses dipping his warm hand into a cold bucket of live smelt, though, like he did with us a few years ago. Lake trout eat a lot of smelt, and Bernie designed a homemade tip-up especially for catching lake trout on live smelt through the ice. Now, you only need a very small treble hook just under the dorsal fin of a smelt to catch one of those big lakers. Now, show me how you reel this in. You don't have any little reel handles on this. No, this uh, I, I invented this reel, but as you see, I, I knocked the handles off mine because mm -hmm. it's hard on the knuckles when it gets loose on you, and, and it gives you better balance. Uh, if, if the reel happens to get against the hole, you don't have any to obstruct the uh, reel from turning. So how do Where, you reel the fish in? Just like this. Just like that. Just like that. For 100, 100 feet, 200 feet. Oh, sometimes you have 500 feet line out there. <laughs> Sometimes it gets cold. Now, what does that do to your finger, though, after? It gets cold. It doesn't hurt the finger. Mm -hmm. no, they, get, tough. they get tough. But um, I prefer uh, no, no handles, no nothing to throw the balance off the reel. And if you've got slush in the hole or against the side of the hole, uh, this reel is still going to turn. Mm -hmm. Nothing to get caught on Nothing there. to get caught. Now, we're coming down to the matchstick, which looks like it's is it coming up here pretty quick. Pretty quick, yeah. That, uh, that'll that mark the uh, the depth of the water. We run a depth finder down first and, and get to uh, the bottom, and then we put a uh, half a paper match in there to uh, to mark that depth. And uh, my way of fishing is to fish uh, four or five feet from the bottom. So when you get the matchstick, you reel it up, and then you use the same tip up in the same hole, and uh, if you can remember day after day mm -hmm. while you fish the same hole with the same tip up, You've had a bad experience with line like this, haven't right. you? It, uh, it cut my finger right down to the bone. I thought I'd lost a fish one time, and, and I grabbed a hold of the line to pick it up, see if it was still on there. Well, he was still on there, and he went down, and, and, and the, line, the line cut right into the bone of my finger. Okay. And it took it all the way till it come to a swiveling line before it snapped off. Huh. So if you're going to test, check the line, pick it up this way. Let's you see if, if you have a fish on it or... Or if especially you're, if there's a if fish you're on it. Jigging your line, but if especially a fish, if you happen to put your finger under the uh, line like this, and there's a fish on it, you take it. There's it's, it'll cut just like a knife, and it's quick. Mm -hmm. So be awful careful with, with monofilament line. So you just grab it with with two right. hands like grab that. Grab with two fingers, a finger and a thumb, and I can feel it that way. And oh, here he is! Here he is! Here he is! I see him right now. Now you play him very gingerly. Oh ho! Oh, a nice yeah. laker. Okay. Now here's what I do. I don't gaff these. I don't gaff a little on my kiss. I would rather, like I say, they can't, they can't swim backwards. Oh, right. Great. A Higgins Lake Lake Trout. Now, there's another unconventional thing that, uh, that you do with the ice fishing spud. You know, everybody puts the rope on the end of the spud so they don't lose it. Right. Uh, my last experience with a rope on my spud, I, I had it uh, looped around my wrist, and I went out on the first ice, and it was probably about four inches of ice, and going along, pulling a sled, and, and checking the uh, sound of the ice with my spud. And all of a sudden, it, it must have been a shelf of ice, and that went right through. Well, it took me with it. Because, yeah. because the rope was around it, your wrist. Right. It was, it was lashed on my wrist, and it took me right underwater, and uh, I almost drowned. Mm. I remember uh, seeing a lot of bubbles and, and small flickers of ice drifting over me, but I was in probably 50 feet of water, and it scared wow. me. How, how'd you get out? I uh, got the rope off there and dropped the spud, swam up, and then I broke the ice until I got to where my sled was. I pulled the sled sideways, broadside to the hole, 
and climbed up on the sled and got out. If I hadn't had the sled, I'd have never got out. Wow. Because the ice kept breaking away as I tried to lift myself out. And I was younger. That was a long time ago. So you, you, were, you were dressed something like this with right. a lot of clothes on. Right. I had on. a heavy coat on. And by the time I got to shore, my sleeve broke off. I couldn't unzip or unbutton the coat. The sleeve actually broke off to get it off. And you know, my other arm was back here from pulling a sled, the rope mm -hmm. on the sled. So I, I don't put any rope on my sled anymore, or on my um, spuds anymore. If they're gone, I can replace the spud. I can't replace my life. Okay, the spool spinning. Would you guys mind if I tried this? Yeah, You've you, caught lake trout before, haven't I you, Terry? I think it's your turn, Be my guest. Your turn. Okay. You want to hold the microphone, somebody? Ah. Well, it's time to peel the gloves off. Now, the, I... the closer you can get your left hand down to the reel, the better off you are. You'll get you mean right less now? tired. When, now, when you bring it up, don't bring the reel all the way out of the water until you get your hand on it, because if, if it happens to run while you're bringing it up out of the water, it'll spin and throw the line out. Now, you're okay. Stick my hand right down in the water? No, no, no. Bring, bring it up. Bring the reel up. No. Okay, you're okay. Now, put your left hand way down here. Uh-huh. There you go. Just Now, you don't have to set the hook. Just, Just wind reeling. him up. Yeah, I can definitely feel the resistance on this. Yeah, you'll feel him on there. See, now, the, this the, is a new kind of battle, you know? Yeah. Without the rod. And when they want to fight, you just hold your palm on the reel and uh, so the reel don't spin free. Look at him. He's, he's all around the... from one side to the other. We've got to be close. Here comes the there sinker. Oh, ho! Oh, oh! Well, it looks like a big one to me. Yeah, it's a nice one. Now, yeah. working its head through here. Yeah. Now we got its tail. Yeah, you go. Back. You're going about it? Oh, way. You're going about this all wrong, I'm, man. Yes. You're supposed to bring him up head first. Head first. Well, watch your mind. You'll get him back with you. Okay, real. here he comes. Here he comes. There we go. There we go. Oh, oh. wow. Bernie, let hey. me hold him. That's great. You got to get him right here. Ah. Oh, let me tell you, it's a cold fish. <laughs> now, is it worth it, though? Oh, oh, this is terrific. Oh, I love it. Lake trout on Higgins Lake. They're fun to catch, fun to eat, but please make sure the ice is thick enough before you try it. And that warning, I'm serious about that warning about safe ice. Mm -hmm. We've gone out on some unsafe ice. <laughs> Matter of fact, last January, I was on some pretty unsafe ice. Pretty, pretty thin. We've done a lot of thin ice on this show, come to think of <laughs> yep. it, in many different ways. We have a big announcement, something that is, well, it was inevitable, I guess, over the years. Uh, John, is, you've worked with me for since? About uh, 11 years now. Wow, 11 years. Yep. And Johnny just gave me the old pink slip, the old divorce notice. <laughs> <laughs> He's moving on. I broke on. it to you easy. You broke it to me easy. Now, we've known that you've been, you've been looking around in the computer industry. You're all fascinated with computers. That's right. And I'm going to be working over at Michigan State University, uh, setting up network systems for them over there. How about that? Yeah. Now, did, did this, you've been going to classes the past year for this. Yeah. Did, I, I just wonder, did me going to law school have yeah, anything it, to do? <laughs> actually, it did. Because, you know, you think about it, as a lot of people probably weren't sure either, we weren't sure how long you were going to stay with this. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, it makes good sense now for me to make a move and, you know, maybe get into a career that I want to, I've always wanted to do anyway. Mm -hmm. so. With computers. Right. So Johnny's going to be our computer man uh, right. here on spare time, part-time mm -hmm. weekends, and setting up a website. That's right. And that should be very cool. So that look forward to that. That is neat. But I what, just wanted to review a few things. I, you whipped these pictures out, John. Take a look at that. That's awesome. There are a couple of handsome ones, huh? <laughs> very proud. About $200 worth yeah. of tuxedos right there for, for the day. But no, we did get, even though my name has been on this, this is the Emmy Award back in 1989. Has my name on it, but hey, anybody who knows anything about TV knows that this was due to John. Well, I appreciate that, but... No, absolutely. Uh, and we've done so many things over the years, accomplished things. You know, people saw us there in the tuxedos. Mm -hmm. But here's what we normally wear. Yeah, no, that was one of my... That's probably my fondest memory of the last 11 years is when we did that trip in Alaska. Oh, man. Well, of course, that was the fishing trip right there. Yep. The and that's, that's what the old cameras looked like, incidentally, with the big camera recorder I was wearing there. Yeah, you had the recorder around your neck in the front and the camera on your shoulder. Yep. Oh, those were gruesome days. <laughs> now, and there you made, made me... No, you're holding the fish, too. Yep. That's Gary Pogany took that picture. That was... Sockeye uh, salmon. 
Man, that was fun catching those. And there you are with that lake trout off the dock. That's right. That was about a 14-pound laker. Do you remember uh, when I was scrambling to get the camera? <laughs> you kept the fish on, and I was, oh. That was four-pound test I caught that on, too, believe it or not. That was absolutely incredible. And that scene right there, that is Gunaseo. Yep, that's now Gunaseo. That, see that little bit of ice on the edge of the frame? Mm -hmm, that, that's a good indicator when that was. Yeah, that's what happens about every couple weeks around here, thaws and freezes. But there you are with the walleye, that famous walleye you threw back. Yep. Well, it wasn't big enough. <laughs> it wasn't. Well, and that, I, I knew I was going to catch a bigger one. Yeah. Nobody else thought he would, but John did. Yep, I did. Uh, right here it is. This is the, uh, oh, I don't know, nine, nine pound plus? A ten pound. Ten maybe. pound. Yeah, I mean, this is one <laughs> big walleye. We have this on display in the museum. We're going to be getting a number of these pictures and, and the story of John Ford's involvement with the show, and he'll still be with us. You can check us out on our website when we get it set up fairly soon. Fairly we'll have soon. an announcement. Well, John, hey, it is, with, it is with regrets but happiness to see you smiling and and moving on with what you want to do, but you will still shoot some features and sure. do some editing and work with us here. Yep. John Ford, the tribute, uh, I guess a good transition. You know how we do transitions? Yeah. Let's go from your trophy to the new part of the show we brought back is? The trophy book. Yeah. Brian Rhodes from Pullman got a dandy Allegan County buck on November 20th, a 12 point with a 21 inch spread heavy beams and long tines. You know, in the Outdoor Digest magazine, we run trophy listings of the big ones from the previous year. Allegan County produced two MSDA trophy bucks on the opening day of 1996. Now, the, the top opening day county that year was Washtenaw with seven trophies. In 1997, the top opening day counties were Lapeer and Montcalm with five each. In January 1998, we've had an ice shortage, but during a normal year, Chuck Sell from Chelsea took this 14-inch, pound-and-a-half crappie from Washtenaw County Lake in January. He caught it on a minnow, of course. A few years ago, Lee Kirby from Wetmore speared this 44-inch, 20-pound northern pike from Straits Lake up in Schoolcraft County in the UP. And here's a 32-pound tiger muskie, nearly 50 inches long, that Bernard Lesky Jr. from Scottville got from Hamlin Lake near Ludington. For this big tiger muskie, let's make Bernie Lesky Jr. our Big John Trophy Angler of the Week. Got one. Did you ever notice how all the fishing shows and the magazines seem to promote graphite and boron rods as if there's nothing else to fish with? And then when you go to the store, you find that these new composite rods are the most expensive ones on the shelves. Yeah, it makes one wonder, how did fishermen catch fish before these modern rods were invented? Professor Finns remembers back in the days before the high-tech rods. Say so we got along just fine with the fiberglass rods. Uh, Forty years ago, I even used to get along with bamboo. This rod right here that I use uh, almost every week uh, is, is fiberglass. The advantages of the boron and the graphite are they're a little bit lighter in weight, they're a little bit thinner in diameters, there's not as much wind resistance if you're using them and casting them all day long. And the only real big advantage is they have a sensitivity advantage that you can feel hits in the bottom a little bit better with them. But the fiberglass worked just fine, no need to really go to the boron or the graphite unless you really want that extra sensitivity. Come on, let's go. Come on. Hunters like to hunt farm woodlots because they're close to home, and many woodlots support good populations of small game. There are hazards in woodlots, though, and dog trainer Mark Raymond answers a lot of questions about these hazards. Here's a typical question. Sometimes when I hunt private farms or even state land, I run across junk piles of rusty metal and broken glass. What can I do to protect my dog's feet from getting cut? There are pads that they have out that go right over a dog's foot to protect them. But uh, they're, they're actually booties that you can put on a dog. But they're very rarely used around here. They use them a lot uh, out west uh, where you have problems with cactus and so forth. The best advice I can give on a question like that is to avoid these areas at all costs. If you find an area that has a junk pile and you like hunting those woods, avoid that certain section. Bring your dog around it, avoid it at all costs. The other thing that you should do is 
carry a first aid kit with you. You should be carrying some kind of first aid kit at all times in case something would happen. A few weeks ago, bow hunter Stephen Way from Muskegon called me to ask if he could bow hunt for small game from a tree after January 1st if he was wearing blaze orange. He said he didn't see anything in the hunting guide that would make small game hunting from a tree with a bow illegal. In fact, on top of page 20, the guide reads, archery hunters may hunt from a raised platform or tree stand. So Steve wondered, why would his local conservation officer say that he'd write him a ticket for hunting rabbits with a bow from a tree? For the answer, let's go to attorney Sal Ghani. I don't know. I'm going to assume we're missing a fact here or someone misunderstood something. But the law is quite clear. You, hunt with, you can hunt during archery season with a bow from October 1st to November 14th and December 1st to January 1st. Now, you can hunt with a bow during firearm season. The rules are you must wear hunter orange. You can even hunt from a platform. Many people don't understand that. You can hunt during firearm season with the bow as long as you're wearing hunter orange and you do not have a weapon when you're in the stand. As it relates to small game animals, you can hunt small game with a bow from a platform, but the rules apply. You, can, you must wear hunter orange. And you cannot have a weapon if you're in the stand. Oh, is that gorgeous? Trout and salmon live in cool, clear water. The flesh of a trout, though, is oilier than warm water fish, like walleye and panfish, and people often like to broil trout and squeeze lemon juice on top just before they eat it. Well, if lemon juice is so good with fish, why not use orange juice? Robert Plant from Lebanon, Ohio, uses orange juice in his trout a l'orange recipe. He mixes up some milk and eggs, which he dips the trout fillets in. Then he dredges them in cornmeal. Instead of going into a frying pan, he sets the fillets in a greased baking pan. Then he pours melted margarine over the top, a stick or two, along with a cup of orange juice. Topped with some Italian breadcrumbs, these fillets are baked at 350 for 30 minutes or until they're fork tender. It's different, but it is tasty. Robert Plant's Trout a l'Orange. This recipe will be in the upcoming issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine. If you have a favorite recipe you'd like to see featured, or you have an outdoor tip, a question for one of our experts, or just a comment, please send it along to me. The content of this show comes from viewers like you. Last Saturday, we had an MSDA Shooting Sports Council meeting here at the museum for sportsmen's clubs that have shooting ranges. Now, the main speaker was Don Chilcote. Years ago, Don was with the Rough Grouse Society. Today, he's the senior Michigan field representative for the National Rifle Association. Now, Don gave a presentation on the various services available to clubs through the NRA, and I've got to tell you, as a card-carrying NRA life member, I was surprised at what I learned about the NRA and politics. Whenever you hear about the NRA in the news, it's always about politics, and generally it's negative, at least from the perspective of the news reporters. But Don Chilcote said the historical focus of the NRA has always been on marksmanship, safety, education, and recruiting new people into the shooting sports, not politics. In fact, it wasn't until 1968 that the NRA got into politics at all. So today, how much of the NRA's budget do you suppose goes into political activities? All of it? Half of it? Well, I tell you, it is only 20%. 80% of the NRA's budget still goes into marksmanship, safety, education, and recruiting new people into the shooting sports. Now, the NRA's politics gets all the press, but what they do today is basically about the positive use of guns, not about politics. So why am I telling you all this? Well, for two reasons. One, you ought to know, so you don't have the misconception that the NRA is mainly a political organization, because mainly it isn't. Secondly, on this show in the coming year, we will be featuring a variety of some very good NRA programs and services from this 80% side. These programs are underutilized by clubs, and they're not a smokescreen for politics. These programs are what the NRA has been about for over 100 years. Now, don't let this political hoopla cloud your image of what the NRA does with most of its money most of the time. We'll get on to what these non-political NRA programs are on future shows.
We've scheduled a series of MSDA workshops around the state, which will be held at six regional camper and RV shows. These workshops will give you a chance to ask me questions in person and ask questions of one of our experts on the show. Now, all of these will be on Sundays from noon till 4. This schedule puts us in Mount Pleasant, Battle Creek, Flint, Novi, Port Huron, and Traverse City in the next two months. Our first workshop will be in Mount Pleasant at the Finch Fieldhouse at CMU. Professor Finns and I will be there on Sunday, January 25th. The following week, Professor Finns and I will be at Battle Creek in the Kellogg Arena on February 1st. We'll be answering questions from you viewers at these shows. Professor Finns, of course, will answer questions about fishing. And for me, hey, any subject is fair game. We also have our MSDA Hunting and Fishing Awards banquets coming up. The first one is for the Shotgun Hunting Awards. It's on Saturday night, February 7th at the Eagles Hall in Lansing. Buffet catered by Coils of Houghton Lake. Tons of food, tons of big bucks and turkeys, and trophy tales for the TV show. Give me a call if you want any more information on these upcoming events. I'm sure you've noticed that the conditions change from almost moment to moment in this state, so our guide report that Matt Razalowski gets from the sources around the state may be changed a little bit, even by the time you hear this. But let's take a look at how they were, at least uh, our reports from a couple days ago. Up in Houghton, blizzard, but the snowmobile trails are great. If you like blizzards, same thing here in Ontonagon, snowmobile trails, excellent. Little Bay to Knock, they're catching a couple walleye, nice big walleye, and some good-sized perch. Up in Marquette here, because of the snow, it is two pound sign, dollar sign, at percent cold if you get the drift. Here over in Manuskong Bay, they're getting limits of, of good eating size walleye. Drummond Island has perch limits. Uh, those seven inches, I'd measure those babies. Wouldn't keep them any less. Myself, that's just my opinion. Getting some pike. Here, Indian River, Black Lake, walleye, good, good eating size walleye. Look at this. i got to get up here. Uh, Long Lake. They're getting excellent pike, good dandy size perch. Got to get that on my schedule here real soon. Oscoda, steelhead has been slow because of cold temps. They actually mean cold fishermen. That's why it's slow. Over in uh, Lake Mitchell, Cadillac. Pike and panfish are good for the diehards. Uh, best ice, of course, near shore. It's the way it is in the Lower Peninsula. Steelhead Fair on the Pear Marquette. Steelhead Slow down on the White River. Over here in, the, in Linwood, off Aw Gray, they're talking about one to three feet of water. They're catching perch. Lake St. Clair, the panfish has been slow because of the muddy water. Uh, goose hunting has been good in Dexter. Hope to bring you some of that action next week. Detroit River, they are getting perch and walleye. They're fair. Take a look at the ice conditions, though. In the southern part of the state, it's real iffy. You can find ice, but it's going to be near shore, and it's iffy. The Upper Peninsula, good thick ice. Snowmobiling conditions, uh, the UP is a great place to go. And the northern lower has some places where there is plenty of snow. A uh, couple events this weekend, ATA registered trap shoot on Saturday, the Dundee Sportsman's Club. And on Sunday, Mid Thumb Bowman are having an archery shoot, a winter archery shoot there for the diehard archers. So watch that ice, but get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. We'll see you next week. And you are from Everett. Yes. How many years you've been hunting? Uh, about 10, I would say. And you're a pretty good hunter? I'm um, pretty good shot. I can't say I've gotten too many, but <laughs> I'm a good shot if I get to see one. So. so you got this one at the early, the September season? Yes. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I got it up at uh, Fine River uh, State Land up there. And uh, this is the only one I saw. And actually, I went to go up, try to get a cow down for an older gentleman that was in the group. And uh, just happened to turn back and see him. He looked straight at me, and it's the prettiest thing i ever seen. But then he went sideways. I wanted to take the shot when he was looking at me, but he went sideways, and that was it. That was it, yeah. huh? Well, I'm, you're a big deer hunter, huh? Yeah, and like, yeah. Mm -hmm. How many deer have you taken? Well, I only got one six-point on the wall. <laughs> well, that's cool. Now, how did you get into hunting? Um, basically, I just, uh, I wanted to do it, and, you know, like that one gal with a bear, you know, I love to hunt, and I love to eat it, you know, eat the meat, so, I don't shoot anything I can't eat, so. Yeah. Well, this is, this is going to take you a while to finish this one off, isn't it? I, I pretty much got it finished off. I really? Got, I got a big roast left, yeah, I've been, um, just chowing on it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Well, congratulations. Yeah, okay, thank you. And that angel with a big six by six.
Whoa.